Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to GIA's Knowledge Sessions. These are a series of talks and seminars about gemology that are fueled by our decades of research here at GIA. At GIA, we consider ourselves very fortunate to be able to study and learn from gems, these amazing uh, class minerals. It's just an opportunity that most people don't get the chance to do, and we really like to take advantage of it. And our mission is to share our discoveries with you. So I'm excited to kick things off today. And um, most of us look at nice, sparkly, faceted gemstones and are amazed. But what we don't always realize is that there's a lot to be learned from the gems in their uncut form. So today I'm joined by um, Dr. Evan Smith. He's a research scientist at GIA. He's going to tell us all about rough diamonds and specifically about their natural crystal surfaces and the shapes that they occur in. Um, my name is Dr. Mike Breeding, and I need to give you a few notes before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. So everyone attending the webinar today is automatically muted. If you have a question, please look at the bottom of your screen at the question and answer feature and submit it through there. Um, you can ask questions as we go. Uh, preferably, if you have them, pop them up there and I'll see them and we'll prepare them for, for Evan at the end. Uh, we'll also be sending a recording of this session to you later today, um, and that message will have a survey. So we'd love to hear your feedback to see what you think about our knowledge sessions and how we can improve. So with that, I'm going to pass you over to Evan. Evan, have at it. Thank you, Mike. So today we're talking about diamonds in the rough. It's a kind of a fun topic because I get to show a lot of pictures, and you're probably used to seeing diamonds like this. If you show people a, an image of some sparkling colorless gemstones, they'll probably just assume that it's diamonds. Um, but we're probably a little bit less familiar with the shape of rough diamonds. What kinds of shapes do we find diamonds in? All people would probably recognize this symbol of a diamond from a playing card. And this symbol has been around for, you know, hundreds of years since we started using diamond crystals in jewelry, like this Roman ring from the third or fourth century. Here's our diamond right there. Um, so diamonds in their best, uh, sort of most ideal form come in this shape of an octahedron. Now, diamonds aren't just used in their rough state in uh, sort of antiquity. We even have some modern rough diamond jewelry shown here got some octahedrons in rings, some cubes that are set in this bracelet. There's a whole range of different kinds of rough crystals. And this is someone's collection from a book from 1902. This person has sketched out their collection of rough diamonds, which I show this picture a lot, but I think it's fitting here too, because uh, it shows a whole different range of morphologies. And uh, right now, it might look like sort of a wild smattering of shapes, but hopefully by the end of this, we can revisit this image and you'll start to see some familiar patterns emerging here. So I mentioned the octahedron as being sort of the most um, ideal crystal shape. And this is controlled by processes during growth. When uh, the diamond is becoming a, a crystal, you're adding new atoms to this shape and they get added to this shape in a particular way according to the diamond crystal lattice. Um, and processes that happen after the diamond has grown can modify that shape. For instance, down here, we've got an octahedral crystal that's now been resorbed. It's sort of been dissolved away. And as sort of a rough analogy, I'm showing a pile of boxes here. Now, these boxes are sort of like building blocks and someone has, sort of arrange these in a very tidy way. This isn't exactly the reason why diamonds grow the way they do, but uh, it gives you a sense that when you have building blocks, there's a certain neat and tidy orderly way to set them up. And it, if um, you then had to take a box off of that stack, you might take it from the corner or from the edge. You're not gonna take it from the face of the crystal. And the same sort of thing applies to diamonds. Uh, now, in diamonds, we don't have cardboard boxes. We actually have something that looks like this. This is the unit cell of the diamond. This is the smallest 
sort of picture you can draw that still describes a diamond and all of its symmetry. So here we've got these little black beads. These are, these are carbon atoms. And in gray here, these are bonds between the carbon atoms. And the blue sort of shows the edges of this crystallographic unit cell. And it gives us the basis of this coordinate system. Uh, we've got this 3D coordinate system in X, Y, and Z that gives us a way to describe uh, different atoms within the crystal or different orientations of vectors and planes so that we can describe and understand crystals in a more, more coherent way. Now, you can imagine uh, this little crystal forming the benefit, the reason why these carbon atoms want to sort of enter this crystal is all about not being tidy necessarily, but about saving energy. Um, when a diamond crystal is growing, say you've got these extra little carbon atoms that are attached to hydrogens, this could be uh, methane molecules, for instance, and the diamond, let's say, is growing from these little carbon atoms that are floating around out here. The reason why this crystal is growing is because there's an energy advantage to having a carbon atom that's joined to four other carbon atoms building up this structure. So this is sort of a lowest energy configuration that the carbon atoms have a tendency to form in. Now, this is just one small unit cell and you wouldn't really see a diamond that looks like this because it's sort of incomplete. It needs to grow a little bit bigger before it would form something that we would actually observe in nature. Uh, so right now it looks like some of these carbon atoms are just kind of floating out in space. They're not really attached to anything. So let's draw some more unit cells around here. For instance, if we take this carbon atom down here, if we add a unit cell below it, well, you can see that carbon atom is actually bound to a carbon atom in this unit cell. If we draw another unit cell, well, we can see actually that carbon atom is bound here. And we could add more and more unit cells here and see that all these carbon atoms are joined to other carbon atoms. And the ideal situation is one carbon atom being bound to four neighbors in a tetrahedral arrangement. And when people build models, either on a computer or with balls and sticks to make a carbon crystal, sometimes they'll make something that looks like this, a tetrahedron, which uh, sort of intuitively makes sense because these carbon atoms are bound to four other neighbors making a tetrahedral configuration. So this whole shape here is a tetrahedron, but this isn't really something we see in nature. We don't really encounter tetrahedral crystals of diamond and there's a good reason for that. If you look at this crystal, let's look at the edge of this crystal here. These carbon atoms are bound to two neighbors uh, and they've got sort of two dangling bonds. They want to be attached to two more carbon atoms, but they're not. So this edge here is kind of unstable. And if you look at the point of this crystal, well look, this carbon atom is only bound to the crystal by one bond. So it's really unstable because anything could come along here and snatch up that carbon atom and destabilize it. Uh, so what would happen if we actually did take off that carbon atom? Well, now we've got a carbon atom at the top that only has one dangling bond and it's still attached to the crystal by three bonds. So this is much more stable now. And we could continue chopping off a couple layers until we have this whole surface at the top of this shape now where all those carbon atoms only have one unsatisfied bond. And that's the most stable kind of surface we can make in the carbon lattice. And that surface, um, if we put it in context of this sort of 3D spatial coordinate system, that surface is actually a plane that we can describe as being in 111 orientation. The meaning of 111 is not that important. What's important is that in this crystal system, that's a very stable configuration where the carbon atoms are sort of happiest. They're the least dissatisfied and they're mostly attached to the crystal itself. And all the other crystals, in, all the other atoms inside the crystal are perfectly happy. They're energetically satisfied. They're attached to other carbon atoms. So if we actually made a more stable crystal of diamond that's just bound by surfaces like this, stable surfaces that are of 
one, one, one orientation, the shape that we end up making is something like this. So here's a collection of carbon atoms. They're all bonded tetrahedrally in a diamond crystal shape. And the surfaces are the most stable surfaces that we can make because they're one, one, one surfaces. And if you haven't seen it already, this is an octahedron. So this is the shape that we talked about as being sort of the ideal uh, diamond shape. And it's made up of these little unit cells. Now, within this coordinate system, we can describe some other planes that sometimes we see uh, within diamond crystals or modifications of diamond crystals. And the ones that are relevant for diamonds are these. So we just saw the octahedron, which is bound by 111 planes. Sometimes we also see forms that look like cubes, and those are bound by uh, 100 planes, again, using this sort of nomenclature of the coordinate system. We also have dodecahedral planes that we would describe as being 110. And sometimes we see combinations of these most important planes. And this is something we would call a cubo-octahedron or a cube-octahedron, depending on who you ask. So back to the natural diamonds themselves. Here's an octahedron. I've drawn on it, trying to show some of the uh, internal features here, because I was planning to cut it for research purposes. Uh, but what I want you to see is that the corners of this octahedron crystal and kind of the edges are a little bit rounded. And this reflects something that happens to octahedral crystals quite often when they're sitting in the mantle or during their volcanic transport up to surface, they get a little bit dissolved or resorbed. So this is something that happens after diamond growth. We see this phenomenon called resorption, which is sort of like dissolution or corrosion of the crystal by fluids or melts that can kind of change the crystal shape. And quite often we'll see octahedral crystals kind of develop into a more rounded form. And again, this is something that can happen uh, either while the diamond is sitting in the mantle for millions of years, or it can happen on its way up to surface when the diamond is sitting in this hot magma that's full of volatiles like CO2 and water the diamond can sort of be etched away. So here's an octahedron on the left, and you can see the edges have sort of been resorbed away. Uh, and on the right, here's another octahedron that's been resorbed even further. And you'll notice that actually the new surface that's appearing here isn't perfectly flat. It's got a little bit of a curve to it, and it also has a little bit of a, a line kind of dividing what would otherwise be a rhombus shape here. So what is this shape? Well, it's roughly approximating what this is, which is a dodecahedron. So this is a nice polyhedral garnet crystal that makes an ideal dodecahedron. It's got flat faces, but what we see in the diamonds is something that resembles that, but the faces are a little bit curved. So even though it resembles this dodecahedral face, we call it a dodecahedroid. And the oid part of it means that it's kind of not really a dodecahedron, it's just approximating a dodecahedron. Again, because these faces are not perfectly flat facets that have grown into that orientation, they've been resorbed into that surface. Uh, and sometimes this is just shortened, people call these dodecs for short. Um, also, you'll sometimes hear the term tetrahexahedroid, which is a more complicated shape where these rhombus faces are actually divided down the middle to make little triangles. And the reason people use that term sometimes is because when you look at some of these dodecs, uh, they actually have a little line, a medial line dividing them in half like this. And they're no longer really dodecahedroids. You could better describe them as tetrahexahedroids. That's a bit of a mouthful. So again, sometimes people just call all of these dodecs. The important thing is that they've been resorbed into this shape. So here's another dodecahedroid. Uh, this time it doesn't actually have those little medial lines. And instead it's been resorbed into this shape uh, that's bound by rhombuses. We also see some ridges on here, and these are another feature uh, that's been exposed due to resorption of the crystal. This is 
plastic deformation. These are plastic deformation lines. And these are actually planes where the crystal has slipped a little bit because it's been deformed. While it was still hot in the mantle, diamond can still uh, squish a little bit. It doesn't quite behave as brittly as it does at surface. So resorption of the diamond can cause it to form in this dodecahedroid shape, but it can also expose some of the internal structures and that can be manifested in the diamond's topography as these plastic deformation lines. And again, here are those rhombuses that make up this dodecahedroid shape. Now here's an interesting diamond. It's sort of half octahedron on this side and half dodecahedron on this side. Uh, this is the other side of this crystal. You can see it's sort of rounded and dissolved on one side and sharp and still maintains its octahedral shape on the other side. This is something called a pseudo-hemimorphic crystal. Um, so it just means that it's different on either side. And the pseudo part of it means it hasn't really grown into this uh, lopsided shape. It's actually been uh, dissolved into this shape. So what's actually happening here is that part of this diamond crystal has been protected uh, because it was embedded inside a rock on its way up to surface and only part of the diamond crystal has been sort of etched or resorbed by fluids. So it's partially resorbed and partially protected, making a pseudo hemimorphic form like this. Now resorption can sometimes be extreme and sort of get rid of most of the crystal structure uh, and, and regular form that we might otherwise expect. And sometimes we can see crystals that appear to be kind of irregular in shape because they've been so extensively resorbed. Uh, irregular shapes can also result from some combination of diamond breakage as well as resorption. Now, sometimes uh, these irregular shapes can also result from the growth itself. So here's a, a very peculiar diamond that uh, is probably controlled by a number of different factors during growth and post-growth processes, including resorption that have made this diamond uh, kind of resemble a swan for lack of a better term. This, and you always end up finding these kind of uh, irregularities the longer you look at some of these crystals. But let's go back to some of the more regular forms. So we talked about octahedral shapes. Sometimes octahedrons can either be elongated um, making a prolate kind of octahedron, or they can be kind of flattened in their shape, making a, an oblate octahedron. This is an example of an oblate or flattened octahedron. And some people might uh, guess that this is actu actually a mackle shape, which is a kind of twin, but this is not a mackle. This contains no twin plane within it. And if you looked at the opposite side of this, you would see exactly what you would expect for the opposite side of the crystal lattice. You would see uh, one single crystal form throughout this entire shape. This is an octahedron that just happens to be flat for reasons that are open to your imagination. Now, beyond the octahedron, we also talked about some cube faces. These tend not to be very well pronounced. Most octahedron don't have any kind of modification into cube faces, but this particular one does. This is the only great example I've seen personally, but this is a, an octahedral diamond and it has these little tiny square faces here that look actually pretty sharp uh, in my opinion. Uh, and I would describe this shape as a cubo octahedral shape. Now this is something you tend to see a lot more commonly in lab-grown diamonds that have been grown by the high pressure, high temperature synthesis method. This is a very common form to see those in, but in nature, cubo-octahedral diamonds are more rare. Uh, here are some examples of more sort of cube or cuboid shapes because they're not perfectly cubes. And these ones are jemmy. In a few slides, we'll see some that are not quite so jemmy. But these ones are gemmy, they're nice single crystals, and these could be cut and polished into beautiful gemstones. Uh, here are some uh, more unusual varieties of cubes, where here these cube or cuboid faces are actually concave, they're like little divots. And 
instead of coming to corners of the cube, the corners of the cube here are actually punctuated by little tiny uh, octahedral or one, one, one surfaces. And these you would call a skeletal cuboid or a, a, a hopper type of, of growth. Uh, here's another jemmy cuboid here. Uh, instead of having concave faces, it actually has sort of convex cube faces. It's probably due to resorption. But the interesting thing about this cuboid is it has these little knobs uh, that sit at the corners of the cubes. And these are probably, again, the expression of little octahedral remnants uh, that are sort of left over during resorption of perhaps a crystal that might have once looked like this. We've got lots of other primary shapes that result from twinning, for instance. So here we can have collections of octahedra that look like they're all stuck together. And if you were to cut through this crystal, you would notice that actually the crystal lattice looks more or less continuous uh, from one place to another because all of these octahedra are perfectly parallel in their growth. That's not always the case though. Sometimes twinning, you can have uh, parts of the crystal that are in different orientations. And the best example I can think of is a mackle. Uh, a mackle is a specific kind of twin we see in diamonds. We also see it in spinel crystals. So it's sometimes called the spinel law twin. Uh, and the reason we see this emerge is because you've got uh, an octahedral shape here and it's got a twin plane right at the, the midpoint of this octahedron where actually this part of the crystal has been swiveled 180 degrees and now we've got uh, sort of a triangular looking tablet. And usually this shape when it grows in nature tends to be more flat and it looks like this. And it's got this twin plane along the perimeter of it, which is highlighted in red here. So this is a mackle. And these mackles can also be resorbed just like octahedral crystals. Uh, resorbed mackles kind of look like a triangular lentil kind of or lens shape. And again, you can see this uh, kind of seam along the outside where the, the diamond twin plane exists. So the, the diamond on this side and the diamond on this side are misoriented by 180 degrees. Now, when we're talking about resorption, sometimes we see these interesting features that appear, subtle features like these little lines or terraces. Um, and, and those mean something. So when the diamond isn't resorbed so smooth and glossy like these crystals, we actually have some information recorded on the surfaces of crystals by post-growth processes. And here's a little sketch showing some of these post-growth processes that we see modifying crystal shapes. And the one that is probably most famous would be these trigons or negative trigons, depending on their orientation. So the trigon is a fancy word for triangle. So sometimes we see crystals and they have these little triangles on the faces. Some other uh, features that we see when diamonds are more strongly resorbed are plastic deformation lines or corrosion sculptures, micro disc patterns. And if this diamond is uh, liberated from its primary host and tumbled in a, a river system, or alluvial deposit, or if it's washed along a beach, it can become physically abraded or mechanically abraded. And we can see surface features that attest to that. So let's look at some of these features. We'll start with the trigons. So here are trigons, these little triangles that have been etched into the crystal surface. And you can see this octahedral face is sort of pointing up and to the right. And these little triangles are sort of pointing in the opposite direction, down and to the left maybe. And because they're in opposite orientations, we call that a negative trigon. The opposite situation where the both triangles are pointing in the same direction happens, but it's much more rare. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of research that's gone on studying the sort of exact geometry of these little triangles and what it might mean. There's experimental work um, especially at Dalhousie University by Jana Fedorchuk. She's done a lot of experiments trying to understand what kinds of fluids and at what temperatures and pressures do these uh, actually little trigons develop. So here are a couple experimental um, runs where 
a diamond has been etched in a, a little high pressure vessel with some kind of fluid. And you can see pronounced differences arise in the geometry of these little pits, depending on the composition of the fluid. So little negative trigons with flat bottoms are something you see prominently in pure water or, or aqueous rich fluids. Whereas if you have a fluid that's very CO2 rich, even pure CO2 in this case, this is when we start to see uh, little pits develop in the opposite orientation. So we can have combinations of positive and negative trigons that actually make a hexagon. So hexagons are something you see when you have lots of CO2 in that fluid. And there's a whole bunch of different things you can tease out of the geometry of these little etch pits by studying them and actually say something about the fluid and the conditions under which this etching is occurring during a volcanic eruption. Now, here are some more uh, little negative trigons in this surface. We can zoom in and zoom in again. And you'll see that these little trigons are actually uh, kind of lined up in rows. And you can see this dark line that kind of connects a lot of these trigons. And this raises the question, why would a trigon form in any particular location? And the answer to that is that these trigons tend to form at some kind of irregularity in the crystal. So they don't just form anywhere. Quite often they form where there's a dislocation that intersects the crystal surface. Or in this case, these little lines are actually uh, mechanical twin planes. So this is a pink diamond. And these pink lamellae, these little uh, planes of pink here, are actually mechanical twin planes where the diamond has been smooshed a little bit and the crystal has actually changed orientation along that plane. This is what it looks like in cross section here. So this is the sort of pink uh, little plane that we've got and the crystal orientation here is different than it is in the neighboring parts of the diamond. And because of this misorientation, this becomes a preferential site of attack for etching. And this is why these uh, little trigons are forming prefer preferentially along that mechanical twin plane. Here's another example here where we've got a line of trigons that's attacking this little mechanical twin plane. And you can follow this line around to the other side of this diamond. We see a couple more trigons and then it actually forms a little bit of a ridge here. Uh, so it really affects how the diamond is being etched. Uh, here's another diamond. This one's quite a bit more severely resorbed. And you can see these very sharp ridges here cutting across this, this diamond. And these are more uh, little twin planes that have been sort of left uh, to etch differently than the surrounding diamond because the diamond is oriented differently in that one plane. Now, here's something that looks similar, uh, but these aren't mechanical twin planes. These are little slip planes so that the, the diamond isn't actually twinned uh, in any respect here, but we've got slip planes where the diamond has squished and there's a lot of dislocation movement. So the, the diamond actually has a lot of dislocations sort of lined up in planes, many parallel planes in this orientation and also in this orientation. And these slip planes again become a different part of the diamond sort of a different, uh, they behave a little bit differently when the diamond is being resorbed. So they don't get resorbed at the same rate as the neighboring diamond. So these slip planes end up being little tiny ridges and we call these plastic deformation lines. And these are something that we notice quite prominently on brown diamonds. And this is one of the first observations we had to suggest that when we see a lot of plastic deformation in a diamond, that diamond also tends to be brown. There's some kind of a link between brown color and plastic deformation. Now, uh, going back to this diagram, so we just saw plastic deformation lines, we saw some of these trigons. Uh, now let's look at a couple of these sort of more unusual uh, kinds of uh, features, surface features resulting from resorption. So here we've got some hillocks. These are sort of almost like the remnants of octahedral crystal planes that have grown in this octahedral orientation. And when you dissolve them away, uh, you can end up with these little ridges here. Now these are quite smooth. We would describe them as sort of teardrop shaped hillocks uh, on this resorbed dodecahedral surface. 
Over here, we've got another hillock, but instead of sort of being smooth, rounded, and teardrop shape, it's got more triangular faces to it. This is a pyramidal hillock. Down on the bottom here, we've got something that looks a bit different. We've got something called corrosion sculptures, these depressions in the diamond that are much more irregular in shape. And these appear not to be so strongly controlled by the underlying crystal lattice. And in fact, the shape of these is controlled in this case, more strongly by the shape of the melt or fluid that's butting up against the diamond. So the, the shape of the, the bubbles and the fluid and, and all that sort of, uh, the shape that that makes against the surface can affect the shape of this uh, resorption and you can end up with kind of irregular, unusual rounded depressions. And a, a really extreme example of this where the fluid or melt controls the shape of the resorption is, is this. These are micro disc patterns. So you can see in this resorb surface here, these faint little circles and some of these circles are overlapping. On the right, this almost looks like the surface of the moon. Uh, you got all these little circles here that can either be slightly depressed or slightly raised. Now, these really don't seem to be following the underlying crystalline architecture of the diamond. And in fact, what we think is happening in these cases is that these are the expression of resorption where there is bubbles. We've got uh, for instance, here's a, a fizzy drink and it's got some lime wedges in it. And this is something we're probably familiar with as an everyday example. Uh, in this volatile rich fluid, sometimes we get bubbles on the surface of foreign objects. So maybe that's what's happening with some of these diamonds where they've got bubbles forming on the surface of the diamond that are either protecting or perhaps enhancing the etching of that diamond just around the, the sort of shape and location of that bubble. So we end up with these circular uh, micro disc patterns. Now, the other thing that can sort of control the localization of etching is cracks. We can either have cracks in the diamond itself that cause uh, sort of an enhanced etching or just around the crack or sometimes the, the rock itself that's encasing the diamond can have cracks in it that then localize the sort of supply of etching fluid. And in either of those cases, we can have etching into the diamond that actually cuts a little rut or a, a little groove into the diamond that again, doesn't seem to follow the crystal morphology very well. Um, here's another example where we've got a little bit of a pit and there might have actually been an inclusion that was sitting there, but when the diamond was resorbed down to this level, that inclusion then became exposed perhaps and has completely been etched out to make a pit. There's a, a lot of uh, different variations that can happen here. Here's a cuboid shape that has sort of a fissure being etched into it and I've polished away uh, a couple uh, 100 microns of this diamond. And this is the polished surface now and light is being reflected on it. And you can see all these little kind of dark patches. And these are actually void spaces now where the diamond has been etched by some kind of corrosive fluid that's penetrated into this little fissure we saw at surface. Now this diamond, uh, you, you'll notice it's kind of gray and kind of cloudy or opaque looking. This is an example of something called fibrous diamond. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Fibrous diamond can sometimes occur as a coat around uh, an octahedral, perfectly gemmy, colorless octahedral core. We can have this coat of fibrous diamond that looks opaque or cloudy. It can be gray or green or yellowish. So what exactly is this fibrous diamond? And what do we mean by fibrous anyway? Well, Let's talk about a, a growing diamond and the crystal surface where this growth is occurring. So here we've got a 111 surface. Remember, this is the octahedral surface. And what we've got here is this crazy spiral. Uh, when we're talking about crystal growth, very smooth, well-controlled crystal growth, quite often the growth occurs on spiral formations like this that arise from a dislocation, a screw dislocation in that crystal face. So it's just a little tiny step in the crystal surface where suddenly we have carbon atoms with 
uh, more exposed bonds where we can then attach new carbon atoms. This becomes a preferential site to grow new material. And screw dislocations like this, making these growth spirals, is what gives rise to most very well controlled, smooth crystals that give us these nice octahedral diamonds. Uh, if we go up and see at the bottom here, I've got a, an axis called increasing driving force. You can think of this as sort of the supersaturation of carbon in this growing medium, a fluid, and it's got carbon in it. And this is a measure of how badly the carbon wants to crystallize into diamond. So if we go into higher uh, driving force, chemical driving force, we can actually have spontaneous nucleation of diamond onto this 111 surface. So rather than diamond having to attach to a little step in the crystal face, it can potentially just nucleate anywhere on that crystal face. And this might be what gives rise to some of those cuboid forms like those skeletal hopper sort of shaped uh, cuboids. But if we go to even higher driving force, we get something else that looks like this. These are diamond dendrites. And so these are like little fibers that are growing, instead of growing within this surface, within that 111 plane, now we've got little fibers of diamond that are growing perpendicular to the 111 plane. And these are 111 vectors. And these vectors, these fibers are allowed to branch in any symmetrically equivalent direction. And the morphology that this tends to make, if left to its own devices, is a cuboid shape. So fibrous growth or dendritic diamond growth like this has a tendency to produce cube shapes. So if you've got a diamond that's mostly fibrous diamond, it will end up making a cube shape. Or if you've got a, a diamond that has an octahedral core and it's just a fibrous coat on top of that diamond, uh, then the overall fibrous diamond will look kind of octahedral, but as that coat gets thicker and thicker, it will start to develop some of these cube faces because of the symmetry of these little growing fibers. Now, the interesting thing about fibrous diamond is that it can contain a lot of inclusions that get trapped between those little fibers. So here's a fibrous cuboid here and I've cut it in half and this is light being shone through it. And you can see all these little tiny specks. If we zoom in here, you can see them better. These are all little tiny inclusions that were trapped as the diamond grew. And these are actually snapshots of the diamond growing fluid. This is one of the few kinds of diamonds that, that uh, um, reliably traps many samples, little droplets of the medium that it's growing from. So these little droplets of fluid that are trapped in here, uh, the work that we've done to study these shows that they're rich in carbonate and water. Sometimes they can be saline in their nature or they can be a little bit more silicic. There's kind of a range of different compositions they can have, but this is the most direct information we have about the kinds of fluids that diamonds grow from. Now, if we talk about fibrous growth like this cuboid, it can also do things like twin. Uh, here's a, a, some fibrous twins, uh, fibrous diamond twins that, that kind of look like a, a jumble of different cubes because they're sharing some uh, common elements of their crystal lattice. Now, if you have more and more crystals in different orientations and sort of make fibrous growth that is more or less polycrystalline fibrous growth, the shape that you get is more like a sphere. Uh, and that's called balas. And balas is a kind of diamond that's almost like a ball. It's sphere-like. It can be very round or it can be kind of sub-round in its shape. And there are actually a few different kinds of crystal growth that can end up looking like a ball. So we've got true sort of balas diamond that is a polycrystalline fibrous growth that's making a, a spherolite of crystal diamond, or Sometimes we have uh, diamonds like a, a fibrous cuboid that's sort of resorbed uh, into a, a more rounded shape and it just ends up looking more like a sphere shape. And in that case, it's not really true balas, it's more balas like. So there are maybe seven or eight different kinds of diamond growth that could 
uh, through some kind of combination of growth and resorption end up looking like a ball-like shape. So there are a few different kinds of balas and balas-like diamonds. If we keep talking about polycrystalline diamond, uh, we have to talk about a very common kind of diamond that is often called bort or bort, depending on how you spell it. Uh, it's also called framicite sometimes. And this is a polycrystalline diamond. It probably has hundreds of different diamond crystals all smushed together. And if you look at some of these voids within it, if you looked in there with a microscope, sometimes you can see octahedral faces of these individual crystallites all sort of smushed together. And this is actually a very common kind of diamond, but most of it ends up being used for industrial purposes. Another kind of um, here, here's another example of a polycrystalline diamond. In this case, you can actually see on surface some of these individual uh, crystals, and it kind of looks sugary in its texture, like a lump of sugar. Uh, but what I, what I wanted to show next is uh, another kind of polycrystalline diamond that is one of my favorites. It's something called carbonado. Now, carbonado is kind of an enigma. Uh, it's polycrystalline diamond. The, the diamonds are sort of micro-sized, so there are many, many diamond crystals all smushed together in these carbonado uh, lumps. And actually the largest diamond ever found, non-gem quality, but largest by weight, is this diamond here shown in black and white. This is the Sergio diamond, which was 3,167 carats. So it's just over a uh, just a little bit bigger than the Cullinan diamond, which was the largest gem quality diamond ever found. Now this diamond was actually, uh, I think, broken up and used for industrial purposes. It has great value as an industrial diamond because it has such small crystals all in random orientations. So it has the hardness of diamond, but it's also relatively tough because if it develops a crack, the crack doesn't propagate through the entire lump of carbonado because it stops as soon as the crystal stops and, and sort of butts up against the next neighboring microcrystal. So carbonado is very, very hard and very, very tough. And until we developed uh, lab-grown or synthetic diamonds for industrial uses, carbonado was the, the best material you could really find for abrasive purposes. Now, carbonado is interesting because um, it has these unusual properties. For instance, it has these pores that are kind of hard to explain. Uh, why would a, a diamond have pore spaces like this? And on some examples, these don't show it very well, but the surface can sometimes be glassy or almost look like it's been melted. And all of these features are really hard to explain by any kind of environment that we know of uh, for diamond crystal growth. So carbonado might actually represent a different kind of diamond growth environment that we are yet to understand. And one of the leading experts in carbonado, Steve Haggerty, who's uh, actually this paper is from this, uh, these images are from his paper. Steve Haggerty uh, prefers the idea that actually carbonado might have formed outside of the earth. It might be an extraterrestrial material that was sort of rained down uh, on the earth, like uh, imagine a, a meteorite made up of carbonado. Uh, importantly, we never actually find carbonado in primary deposits. We've yet to find true carbonado embedded in a kimberlite. So we have no real evidence that it's actually come out of the earth like other kinds of diamonds, which again leads to this idea that maybe it's not from inside the earth. It's an it's a outstanding mystery. Okay, let's come back to these surface features here, uh, back to some normal diamonds. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was what happens when you have a diamond that is washed out of a primary deposit and ends up in a river system or is washed along a beach uh, or ends up in a marine deposit? Well, the diamond itself undergoes mechanical abrasion. We have chipping, scratching, and grinding due to mechanical abrasion as the diamond is kind of hitting and, and rubbing up against other boulders or sand in that system. Uh, and a diamond like this, because it's been ground down, it actually has this kind of frosted texture that almost looks like uh, glass. If you've ever found a piece of ground glass at the beach that's been washed around, it kind of has this frosted look to it. Um, so 
Here's another uh, diamond. This is a dodec or a tetrahexahedroid, if you remember that term, with these medial lines dividing the rhombus faces. Uh, but what we see here is that these edges uh, look a little bit bright in this picture because they're actually kind of uh, frosted. These edges have been abraded away. Here's another uh, tetrahexahedroid or uh, rounded dodec. And in this case, we see these uh, sort of crescent shaped features here. These are percussion marks where the diamond has been hit with a boulder and, and sort of cracked in this little crescent shape. Now, if you were to just see this diamond uh, removed from its geological context, just based on these crescent shaped features, you could probably guess pretty accurately that this was recovered from an alluvial deposit. And more extreme examples, we can see diamonds being completely just rounded off and frosted. Now this diamond looks kind of black because the surface is so ground down, but if you shine a bright light into this diamond, uh, inside the light can now exit through the surface and you can see the surface textures a little bit more clearly. And this surface uh, is ground down and you can see all these little tiny uh, semicircular sort of crescent shapes, lots and lots of little tiny percussion marks. So this is a severely um, eroded diamond that was probably washed along a beach at some point in its history uh, to achieve this degree of mechanical abrasion. Now, I've shown a lot of pictures here today and a lot of these uh, pictures are from this book, uh, which I, I like this book a lot because it has some great pictures in it that uh, show some of these features. So if you'd like some further reading, I, I'm not usually in the habit of recommending books, but because I've shown a lot of the images from this book, I, I would like to recommend it. Uh, it's uh, Diamonds in Nature by Tappert and Tappert 2011. Uh, it's available electronically. Uh, if you're also interested in seeing more rough diamonds, I would recommend that you go online. And there are lots of great images on websites like mindat.org or even uh, places that are selling rough diamonds, online stores, for instance, John Betts Fine Minerals, or even if you look on eBay, there are sellers uh, offering rough diamonds. And it's a great way to see a wide variety of different uh, shapes and surface textures that exist in nature that you might not see uh, necessarily uh, just by looking at jewelry. So if we come back to this picture that we saw earlier, this sketch, uh, hopefully some of these forms now look a little bit more familiar to you. We've got examples of these sort of ball-like or spheroidal diamonds that we would call balas or balas-like diamonds. We've got examples of twin octahedra. We've got dodex or tetrahexahedroids. We've got some that look more elongate. Uh, for instance, this little elongated octahedron down here. We've got irregular shapes and we've got mackles that are these sort of tabular triangular features and mackles themselves are twins but sometimes the twins can further be twinned. You can make multiple twinned mackles that, that end up making these uh, six pointed star shapes. We've got lots and lots of examples of irregular shapes. The possibilities are, are really endless and um, I think um, it's really interesting. I, I always have a great time looking at rough diamonds. It's always fun to sort of figure out what's going on and what kind of a shape it is that you're looking at. So I'd like you to remember uh, from this presentation that the diamond morphology that we see uh, when we, we pick up a rough uh, diamond, that morphology is a function of this atomic scale lattice, the crystal structure of the, the, the diamond itself at the atomic scale. And the shape is, is sort of controlled by two competing things. The processes during growth, that is how the atoms are being added to that crystal as it's being built up. And also the processes after growth, that is the processes perhaps that are uh, removing diamonds by resorption or abrading the diamond away. And all of those features, both the growth and the modification post-growth, that whole shape of the diamond is sort of a record. It's a physical record of all of these geological processes. So I hope the next time you look at a faceted diamond, you pause for a moment and think about the diamond in the rough. Now, I'll take any questions if you've got them. 
Thank you, Evan, for all that wonderful information. It's not often that we get to hear lots of details about rough diamond surfaces and, and forms. There are a number of questions, so we'll just kind of start at the top. Um, one of the early ones says, if the octahedral plane is the most stable plane in the diamond, why is it also the cleavage plane and the glide plane during deformation? Yeah, so it's it's stable because there are few, um, that, that orientation of a plane has very few, um, if you draw a plane through the crystal, there are very few bonds intersecting it. So that surface has very few dangling bonds. So it's a stable outer surface of the diamond, but because it has very few bonds passing through that plane, it's also a plane of weakness. There's sort of in that orientation, there's the least amount of uh, pull holding the diamond together. So it creates this uh, weakness where the diamond can either be split apart or where it can be sort of sheared by plastic deformation at high temperatures in the mantle. Cool, thanks. Um, another one is, is there a way to distinguish resorption uh, easily from alluvial wear? How would you describe the best way to do that? Yeah, I, I think um, usually if you look at the diamond under magnification uh, with good lighting and you can see it well, mechanical abrasion tends to look frosted it's like the diamond has been chipped away in, in sort of the micron scale. It looks like it's been ground down. So it has a more matte appearance, whereas resorption tends to make more glossy looking surfaces, even when it's, um, when it's not perfectly shiny and glossy and it's more of a corroded crystal surface, it can appear uh, rough, but under higher magnification, you can see lots of um, aspirites and points uh, whereas a mechanically abraded surface is sort of smoothed and frosted and matte looking. So I, I would sort of base it on uh, one, whether it's sort of glossy and sparkly or matte and ground like frosted glass. And the other thing is just the, the shape of the surface. Does it have these little um, percussion marks or the edges ground away? Uh, and, and if you're lucky enough to know where the diamond is recovered, if it's recovered from an alluvial deposit, quite often you're going to see some of these mechanically abraded surfaces. So it sounds like it's all about the texture. Very much so, yeah. We have several questions about trigon, so I'm going to kind of uh, put those together for you. Hopefully it's not too much at once. Um, one of the questions is, if you see a trigon on a colorless stone, is that definitive evidence that it's a diamond? And then a following question would be, uh, do trigons ever occur on laboratory grown diamonds? And then finally, sorry to complicate this, but um, how do you know trigons are from etching rather than from primary growth? Okay, um, so the, the first one, what was the first question? <laughs> <laughs> if you see uh, trigons, does that prove that you're dealing with a diamond? Right, um, I, I would say not necessarily for two reasons. Um, one, you can carve, uh, uh, for instance, a topaz crystal. We've seen lots of those where a topaz crystal has been carved to make it look like a diamond and someone can carve a triangle into it very easily. Uh, so you have a colorless thing that looks like a crystal and it has what look like trigons on it, but it's not even a diamond at all. Uh, and I'm sure there are other uh, crystals like spinel crystals um, that are colorless but can, you know, they share a lot of the same crystal structure and can develop the same kind of uh, etching pits within it. Uh, I think the next question was about yeah, lab, lab grown. Do you ever see trigons diamonds. on lab grown? Um, generally, we don't see trigons on lab grown diamonds. And, and the reason for that is, is that uh, the, the sort of process to make lab grown diamonds is all focused on growth. There, there's no real stage in there that's resorbing the diamond. Uh, and, and the other thing I guess is that the, uh, the fluids involved in lab grown diamonds are, are uh, usually a metallic flux. So it's a very different kind of fluid that the diamond is interacting with. So it, even if you did try to etch away the, the diamond in uh, metallic flux in a, in a lab grown diamond. If you tried to change the conditions that the diamond was being dissolved rather than grown, 
the features you would see would probably be different and you wouldn't produce trigons per se. Uh, I, can add question... a little, I can add a little bit to that and say that in 17 years of looking at diamonds at GIA, I've seen one lab grown diamond that had a trigon on it. So it, it can happen, but as Evan said, it's almost, <laughs> almost never. So and the last one is how do you know they're etching related to etching? Right, right. Um, so, the, I mean, the biggest reason we know this is because uh, you can reproduce it very easily in experiments. You can put a diamond that has nice flat uh, crystallographically controlled octahedral faces into a vessel with water or CO2 or some kind of a, a melt with a lot of volatiles in it, and you can easily reproduce these features. And we know that the, the fluid that it's interacting with is undersaturated in carbon and carbon is being removed from the crystal because the, the weight of the crystal decreases after the experiment. We know that carbon is being removed. All right, um, there's a question here about uh, dissolution. Um, it, it seems like it'd be pretty hard sometimes to tell whether shapes of crystals are from dissolution or growth. So what, what criteria do you use to determine if resorption has occurred? Yeah, there's a whole um, field of study dedicated to sort of understanding in detail what all of these surface features mean. But in general, um, octahedral surfaces that are sort of the result of growth tend to make very sharp uh, triangular um, features. So either you've got a, a nice smooth surface octahedron where the faces are triangles, sometimes you can have stacks of triangles, uh, but the triangles are sort of uh, stepped with sharp steps and they have sharp points. Whereas resorption uh, tends to eat away at the corners and the edges and make very rounded looking forms. So when an octahedron gets resorbed, the corners and the edges take on a more rounded um, rather than very sharp appearance. And when the crystal is fully resorbed and is no longer an octahedron, but is this dodecahedral shape, the outer surface of it is very strongly kind of rounded rather than being very flat faceted polyhedral shapes that would be produced by growth. So the, the answer, I guess, is that resorption tends to make rounded, smooth kind of shapes. Great. Um... And then do you have any, are there any estimates out there and done in research about how long these sorts of etching and resorption processes take geologically? Um, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I mean, it's very quick to, to say the least. It, it, most of this etching that we see, a lot of it looks like it's dominated by water that's related to the kimberlite eruption. Um, so the time span of a lot of the resorption we see is on the same order of magnitude as the kimberlite eruption itself. And we think that kimberlite eruptions that bring diamonds from the mantle up to surface are things that occur over the course of maybe hours or days. So a lot of the resorption we see is probably taking place relatively quickly on a geological time span, especially if you compare it to the length of time we think it takes to grow a diamond, <laughs> which we think might be millions of years or more. That's pretty amazing, the, the difference there, how fast one process is. Yeah. A um, couple of questions on uh, fibrous diamonds, and I'll combine two of them together. Does fibrous growth count as polycrystalline diamond or not? And are fibrous diamonds classified as gem diamonds or non-gem diamonds? Okay, yeah, those are great questions. The first one, uh, is it polycrystalline or not? It depends on who you ask. Uh, sometimes it's sort of cast as being polycrystalline because people describe uh, a gem quality octahedral diamond as being a monocrystal which then by default means that anything that's not that is some kind of a polycrystal. Um, but I, I would say that it's more like a single crystal because it maintains that uh, crystal symmetry. If a fibrous diamond grows and makes this cube shape, that means that the diamond lattice at one end of that shape and the other end of the shape are in the same orientation. 
So the, the orientation of the diamond lattice has been maintained across that whole cube. So based on that criterion, I would say that it's more likely that this should be classified as a single crystal. And I would liken it to a snowflake, which is another kind of dendritic uh, crystal that grows by branching. And all of the parts, all the different branches of a snowflake are in the same orientation. And that's why a snowflake has this overall symmetry to it that makes a, a six pointed kind of star or hexagon. So by the same virtue, a, a polycrystalline diamond wouldn't make a shape that's got this outward uh, symmetry to it. So I think you really have to call a fibrous diamond uh, a single crystal growth event that's just uh, very branching. And the second part of that, is it ever used as a gemstone? Usually not because it has a lot of micro inclusions in it. So it tends to be uh, either opaque or cloudy in appearance, but it can be used as a gemstone. You can cut uh, for instance, a, a fancy gray color that has a low clarity from it, or you could use the cube as is. Uh, we saw at the beginning, I showed a bracelet that was made up of uh, cuboid shape uh, diamonds, and those were all fibrous diamonds. And sometimes uh, these can have some interesting colors too. For instance, they can be uh, kind of a vivid yellow color that makes them even more attractive. So cubes aren't totally written off for their uh, application as a gem. I mean, it's all in the eye of the beholder. A lot of people find it very interesting, including myself. All right, thanks. Um, we're out of time, but I'm gonna ask you a couple qu more quick ones because I thought they were sort of interesting. Um, sure. With regards to carbonado, do you, do you know how rare carbonado is and, and how rare is it compared to other gem diamonds? Yeah, as far as I know, it's extremely rare. Sometimes the word carbonado gets applied to any polycrystalline diamond, especially if it's dark in color. But in its strictest sense, what qualifies as carbonado has only been really recovered from, um, from a place in Brazil and then another place in, in Africa. If you imagine uh, before the Atlantic Ocean opened up, uh, where Brazil joined, um, joined Africa, that sort of overlap in regions between Brazil and, and Africa, those are the two regions where we find carbonado. So if you consider them being uh, from a single kind of thing, a meteorite that fell from the sky in that region before the Atlantic o Ocean opened, then maybe you've only really got one sort of area where carbonado was deposited. But overall, yeah, carbonado is extremely rare. So yeah, it's kind of cool to think about. So it's wild material. Yeah. All right. And then the last one, simply because I love uh, impurities and diamond, I have to ask you, um, how do things like nitrogen and boron affect the morphology and or the resorption of diamond? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a tough question. I think <laughs> nitrogen um, or boron, I mean, they're similar in size and, and their chemical characteristics. They're similar to carbon. So they can be incorporated into the growing crystal the same way sort of that carbon is as this crystal is uh, accumulating atoms from the surrounding growth fluid. It can pick up these things. But what can happen is in, in extreme cases with any impurity, they can sort of um, block off that region of the diamond. If you attach a nitrogen atom to the edge of the diamond, now the, the next uh, carbon atom that comes in isn't going to see carbon atoms, it's going to see this nitrogen atom. And it, I'm sure that has some kind of an effect to the way it grows. Um, I, I don't know for sure if th there's really discernible effect in natural diamonds if um, adding nitrogen, more nitrogen to the system really changes the crystal morphology we see. Um, and, and, and kind of a follow up to that, the, the type, the large type two diamonds that you've done a lot of work on are all quite often very resorbed, right? Yes. Is that thought to be a product of their, where they grew? Yes. That, so we're talking about those large type two A diamonds that we now think are quite often sublithospheric in origin, um, they are almost always very, very strongly resorbed. And 
that is probably a function of the place where they grew and the way they get up to surface more so than it could be due to their lack of nitrogen. So they're strongly resorbed because of the geological processes that have resorbed them as opposed to something special about the diamond themselves. So having more nitrogen in its structure probably wouldn't armor it against that resorption. All right, good. I think you answered that pretty thoroughly. Thank you. All right, with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, if you have any lingering questions, you can find GI on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, thank you all for coming and joining us. Um, we'll hope you will join us again next week. Uh, we'll be graced by GI instructor Kate Waterman, who will discuss the history of engagement rings. So it should be a fun and, and different uh, bit of a knowledge session. So hope to see you then. And thank you all for attending. And thanks once again, Evan, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.